All right. I always get the question, is Helm popular? Hmm, this room seems to be somewhat full. So it must be somewhat popular. Hey everyone, welcome to the session today talking about Helm. Chart your course like a champion. My name is Andy Block. I'm a distinguished architect at Red Hat and a Helm maintainer. I want to introduce the wonderful panel here that's going to walk you through the entire charting your course like a champion. We'll start over here with Scott. Scott. Hey, I'm Scott Rigby. Oh, hey, that will help. Hi, hey, Scott Rigby. Um, I am one of the Helm maintainers. I also co-maintain Flux and some other things in CNCF. And uh, yeah, yeah, I used to co-maintain the, uh, the stable and incubator charts repos, so I can help answer questions about that as well, and it's just nice to be here. I'm Joe, I'm Joe Julian. I also am a Helm maintainer. Um, I work somewhere I can't talk about. <laughs> some, some kind of stealth thing. Stealth thing. I have, I have written a lot of charts uh, professionally, so I know a little bit about it. Okay. And I'm Karina Angel. Um, I also work at Red Hat, and I'm also a tech lead in Tag App Delivery um, Technical Advisory Group. Does anybody know what the technical advisory groups are? Raise your hands. I don't see many hands. Okay. All right, sounds good. Um, okay, go ahead and getting started. Um, really, we're looking at mastering the art of Helm charts, because what is a Helm chart? It is like a recipe. Okay, let's look at the menu. We have our chart structure, our life cycle, our objects. Uh, let's go on to the entrees, which they actually are all gonna talk about in a little bit. And then your desserts, your testing, your release management. Um, and then as we look at, uh, we don't even have notes up here. What happened to them? I'd like to say that I can do this without notes, but it's been a very long week, so bear with me while I actually look at the notes. What are you running on? Keynote? Okay, that's okay. Um, who here um, is new to Helm, actually? Okay, anybody on this side? You are? Okay, okay. Um, if you go to helm.sh, we have, or helm.sh, we have, it's really comprehensive, our web docs, all the intro docs, please go there. We didn't focus this on an intro to Helm session because we do have a lot of people here that know Helm. So we're looking at, um, So I also want to know who here um, is a maintainer of a project or contributes to a project. I only saw like three hands. Seriously, we're at KubeCon. No, let's be serious. That means there's plenty of opportunity in the room. I know, right? Okay, okay. Um, wow, this is this is going to be. Um, we have to talk. So I know who wants to be a maintainer. Who wants to contribute? Okay, thank you. Uh, please go to the Helm booth. Please show up to the meetings because this project that many people rely on uh, requires contributors, requires maintainers. Uh, not everybody gets paid to do this, right? Anyway, this is a very popular project and for good reason. Uh, we are... Um, it's package management for Kubernetes, right? Okay, so who here does use Helm charts in their applications, see? A fair bit more than the number of maintainers and contributors. Right, All and right. who writes your, who writes Helm charts? Okay, okay. All right, so we have to talk to all of you. All right, so when you're, let's look at the primary components and we'll keep moving on. All right, you have your Helm chart, right? You have your values config, um, and then using the CLI, we can release your chart. And let's look at the chart structure. Um, it's like a tarball, right? And these are the files that we're gonna look at, but really, I do want to pass this on because actually the meat of this is gonna be 
between these three. So, uh, So the Helm chart, um, as you saw in that, in that structure, has a number of components. The first topmost one would be the chart YAML. Um, it's, it's the tool to tell Helm what this thing is, how it's used, um, mostly to communicate that to users. So the, uh, there's references to the chart homepage, there's documentation, um, there's support resources that all, all should all be linked from your Helm chart so that your users can find out how to use this thing. Um, there's, there's annotations, which are fairly freeform. Um, if you want people to find your chart, you can go to Artifact Hub. They've got a, a long list of annotations that you can add to your charts so that it'll actually populate their GUI and make it look all nice and pretty. Um, and it makes it dis discoverable. Super the, the, the big one also is if you have issues with the charts as you're consuming it, because you, there's a lot of charts out there in the open source. Being able to understand what resources provide assistance, whether it be a GitHub repository, whether it be uh, an email that you can email, or email um, support channel, or even a Slack channel. Being able to provide as much information as you can inside your chart.yaml makes your chart more consumable. The worst that I ever see is a chart YAML that has a name, a version, and a description. That's not gonna be very helpful. If you provide full metadata, you make your chart more discoverable, more usable, and more consumable, and easier for you all. Yeah, can I chime in on that real quick? Um, and specifically, my favorite is the Git repo. So uh, the reason for that is there, there are people that want to contri probably contribute to your chart. Um, there are possibly people that want to contribute to your chart. That's what I mean. I don't know what charts you maintain, but, or, or what charts you write. But, um, but it's very likely, you know, especially if someone finds it there. And um, what's going to happen if they don't know where the source repo is? There may be emails, you know, for ma the maintainers or the, the list of the chart, the maintainers of that chart. But honestly, a lot of people are shy and also um, uh, impatient. So even if there's a way to possibly contact you, it's very likely people aren't even going to bother because they said, well, we need to use this now. They're going to fork that and they're going to make their own changes themselves, and any benefits that they add aren't going to get into your charts. So that's just a suggestion. Please do that. And, um, and yeah, if you don't know what we're talking about, it's not part of the main uh, chart.yaml, but if you look on artifacthub.io, what Joe is talking about, there's a list of the annotations. So that one would be great. It's just key value and just say source or something like that. Um, and people will love you for it. I, I even do that with the charts I just write for myself. I, put, I still post them up publicly. Every once in a while, somebody actually finds one and wants to use it and actually sends me a pull request. It's really surprising. Uh, oh, and the, the, the other thing you can do on them is you can clearly denote which charts are deprecated. So if, you, if you're done with this chart, you don't want to do it anymore, you can, there's a, a way to mark that deprecated so that people can still find it, still use it, but they'll know that it's the end of life and they need to figure something else out. Now I see somebody else self-documenting. Yeah, I can talk about this as well. Definitely um, utilize the tools for like self-documentation. So if you're looking at really making life easier on yourselves as creators, I can't tell you how much pain I had trying to go and populate a readme to make my values um, consumable. How many experienced the challenge of creating good documentation for Helm charts? How many of you are doing it manually? There are tools that can help with that. So they're not necessarily a part of the Helm project, but other projects have seen some of the challenges. And you can leverage those and adding comments into your values.yaml file will allow those other tools to be able to render a readme automatically. You can create basically a template for your readme and it can get rendered. You can do it as part of a pre-commit hook. You can do it as part of CI. You can really start taking advantage of the tools available to make a chart, you know, you as chart designers and producers much easier. One of them is Helm Docs. There's a couple other ones out there, but Helm Docs is the one that I personally use. Um, definitely look into that. Also, honestly, like I'm lazy, so I had started for a long time not making a big table of the values in the README. But if I, if I had had Helm Docs earlier on, I totally would have done that. I would, but I, but it's also legit to say, 
hey folks, just do um, Helm show values or whatever, and just make sure you put comments in your values file. But so, good. so the next one is going to be on the on on the library charts. How many of you either know what a library chart is or have used a library chart itself? You know, created one. Okay. As you start to develop more and more charts, similar charts, you're going to start seeing patterns evolve. And instead of having to do the same pattern over and over and over, one that I use typically is I want to be able to support either a, for the image reference, either a tag or a SHA digest. But I don't know which one I want to use, potentially. Some might be available in SHA format, some might be available in digest format. So I can go ahead and create a reusable partial function, put that into my library charts, and then just bring that into all my other charts. It makes it really easy to create you know, a set of very clean application charts without having to fill out your helper's YAML file or any of your par partials with the same data over and over and over. And then finally, use you know, intuitive names for your functions and your partials. Make it so that it is like, you know, like images.name or uh, names.namespace. Makes it really easy for you to plop it in over and over. It makes it easier for consumers to be able to do the same. And I'll switch over to Joe now. So obviously, I mean, as everybody knows, a Helm chart is made up of templates that are rendered and applied against a Kubernetes API. So you, you fill out your Mad Libs, you got all your, your, your spaces there for uh, your values, and uh, <laughs> you just know this. And, uh, and it'll create the it'll create your your resource and it will apply it to, to the API, um, creating all the the you know, deployments and services and all that stuff, stuff that you wanted to deploy. Um, for those who don't know, GoLang template or yeah, um, Helm templates use the GoLang template engine with a bunch of functions. Um, there's most of them are Sprig. There's a few others that are just built into Helm, um, but they're a really powerful set of tools, even though they're really simple. And you can do some really powerful things with them if you use them correctly. Um, and then, you know, the other question, which I hear a lot, is why do I need to use Helm? Why wouldn't I just create manifests? Um, and, and I tell people that if manifests are right for you, do it. Um, sometimes you don't need to template things. You only need to deploy the same thing over and over again. It's no point. Um, but if you want to ship your product to other people and you want other people to have, be able to configure it for their own needs, that's usually when, when Helm comes, becomes really powerful. Um, oh yeah, and remember that values YAML is not a template. Don't put, don't put your, uh, don't put your Golang uh, formatting into it because it's not going to render. Um, but but the, uh, the really the powerful part of all of this is those functions, and. Uh, and name templates. <laughs> so uh, with name templates, you're able to write your own functions to, uh, to, to do processes. They may, be, they may be complex processes. They may be just be repetitive processes like, like it was, he was talking about. Um, so uh, with complexities, you know, like on this one, I got this complex project. This complex, I've seen actually, this is, simple by comparison. I've seen some that have ands, or ifs, ands, or, or, or if, and just like, it goes on for like, literally to went for a half a screen that I had to tear apart. It's unreadable. You can't, you don't know why it's doing what it's doing, how it's doing it. Um, you know, it's, it's just really hard to read. But if you take this all apart, and I didn't, I don't have an example, but if you take it all apart and put in a name template, you can actually just do like, if this thing, then do this. And you can like, do, do a, nest, a bunch of nested ifs that are actually readable. And then when you go to call it, you just say include this named function dot, and then it'll do all that complex logic and actually give you a result, whether it's, well, it gives a string result, and I'll go over that in a minute. But, uh, but yeah, it, it just accepts a dict also, so you, can, you don't have to pass it all your values. You can just say, oh, I want this function, and it's going to process these three things, and you build your dict and pass it in. So it's it's really powerful if you if used correctly. Can can I note one quick thing? Um, I don't think we don't have a slide to talk about this right now, but we can talk afterwards if anyone wants to. If you're not using a post renderer, this is this is a really good section to think about it in because if you've got I don't know if you, any of you know about this, but Joe, you were you were saying people ask you why not just use manifest or why not use customize? 
They are great tools. Do it, do it, absolutely. But um, one thing is you don't have to choose. So either or, you can have your Helm chart with these name templates. You can have basically your repeating common logic, right, that, that you two were talking about. But if you've got edge cases, you know, like say you reuse this template across your org, or excuse me, this Helm chart across your org or between several orgs or whatever, and you've got an edge case that you're only using once, use a post renderer for that. You don't necessarily need to clutter your chart with that logic. And what a post renderer is just means that you can actually use a customized patch with a Helm chart and that uh, you don't have to spit out templates for it. You can, you can, there is a step during the Helm release lifecycle that you can choose a post renderer and just use that little patch, one or two or however many patches you have for your edge cases. It's nice, it can keep your charts clean and look into it if you haven't. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really great too because then you can, take, you can take some upstream chart that doesn't support the things you need for your dev prod uh, or de dev uh, integration and prod and you can use customize to build dev integration and prod. Um, so name templates, here's an example. This actually comes from your basic uh, Helm create function. Um, and it, it's slightly complicated because first of all, your names of things can only be 63 characters long. Uh, so if you happen to name your release, you know, some really long string, it's, it's going to fail if you try to, if you try to append say the name of your, uh, your release to it. So you've got your chart name and release name, and that's how it's, it creates some defaults. Um, and it truncates it all at 63 characters, but, but you also might want to overwrite, overwrite it. And that's where you have the, uh, the chart name values name, dot, name override. So if you, put the, if you put in your values, name override equals something. When it comes to that part, it'll replace all the stuff that it's creating with the name that you wanted it to be. So, this is really cool because then you can take and you can put a reference to this any place you need to name something. So all your deployments, your services, your um, ingresses, whatever. Um, and that way you only have to do it once. You don't have to have all this complex logic of figuring out what is the name of this resource. You just have this, this named template that, uh, that you call with just a, it's just, just a include and include foo dot full name dot, and it'll actually do we just spit out the, uh, the the formatted name based on that thing. And you can see as I did as I show there, if you run a Helm template, my release foo, that whole thing just creates my release dash foo. Anything else to add? No. Um, and you can do a lot of this stuff because there are a lot of built-in objects. So. Obviously, we talked about values. Everybody knows values. Values is what goes in your values.yaml file. It, it is presented as values dot and then whatever's in your, your, uh, your YAML. Um, I think everybody's familiar with that. But there's also release, which actually, the previous slide, can I go back with this? Oh, yeah. Um, so you can see here, it actually uses dot release dot name. So it's the name of the release. So when I helm template my release foo, my release is the name of my release. And so it actually uses that information in building the name. So you can use, uh, there's several fields under release that you can look at. Um, there's actually chart, subcharts, and templates. So under those objects, you actually have all the, 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 the data that's in the chart, the subchart, the template. You actually, I actually have a chart that I wrote at Red Panda that I wanted to pass a bunch of values to it, but I didn't want to have to make the user duplicate all the same values in the values YAML file for the parent chart and the subchart. So I set a flag in the subchart, which is basically tells the subchart, don't render this chart. And then I built all the values from the master values for the subchart. And then I just used the, uh, the files, actually I used files down there to reference the file of the subchart and template the whole thing in the master. It's really, it's really hacky, but it works really well. Um, so it's fun little tricks like that. You can use, use all of these for um, capabilities, of course, will tell you what capabilities your API has. Um, if, you're, if you run this against the, an actual uh, Cube API server, it'll tell you the capabilities of that API server. 
Um, if you wanted to look at all these objects, which I do all the time because there's always things that I forget where they are, um, it's really simple to just create a YAML file that just dump everything. I usually throw something like that into the actual chart that I'm rendering, and then I'll do a Helm template and get all this massive amount of data, and then I'll find the piece that I want. But it's really handy to uh, to look at all the different variables in there. The yeah. documentation lists them, but it doesn't list them in depth because in depth there's there's a bunch of things that that are there that aren't and only there because of the way you wrote your chart. It's these little tips and tricks that save you a lot of time. You know, you do the same thing over and over and over. Okay, maybe you save 30 seconds here, but that adds up. If you look at all the different types of objects, not all the different options that are available. So, you know, we really want to emphasize today is really a lot of the tips and tricks that you all can use to be successful. So out of the functions, um, those are the built-in objects. Uh, you can use a lot of these functions on those objects. Uh, prim primarily, the functions are provided by Sprig, which is uh, an upstream repo. Um, Sprig, Sprig provides a complete list of a library of, of functions, so, you know, string manipulation, mask, dates, um, lists, uh, everything listed there, um, and then and a bunch more. Um, some of, the, some of the ones that I've, I'm going to highlight here, uh, two from YAML and JSON, those can be really handy. Um, for one thing, the named, named templates that I was showing earlier, they always return a string, always. But if you may want something more than a string, you may want it to return a dict. If you take your output from the named pipe, run it through two, two YAML or two JSON, and then take the output of that and run it from JSON, you end up with a dict. It's super handy. Um, and you can do things like version comparison, which is also useful. Uh, you've got a, an application that has, that's, that supports this flag this way in this version, but then the, the major version upgrade changes that flag and you have to do it a whole different way. Um, if you compare the, uh, if you do the version comparison against, let's say the tag, which should hopefully represent the version of your application, you can change the behavior of your chart to match the version of the software you're, you're serving, which means you can have one chart that supports multiple versions of your application. I use that heavily at Red Panda. Um, and of course, you can also, because it's checking versions, you can also query the, uh, the capabilities of Kubernetes, and it'll tell you the version of Kubernetes, and you can check, check against that and test, you know, oh, this version of Kubernetes doesn't have this resource. You're running a very, very old ingress resource for some reason. You can ensure that, <laughs> well, okay, we want to make sure we use this API group versus that API group. So you can extend the, extend the, num the, the range of Kubernetes versions that you can support with your Helm chart if you have, let's say, enterprise customers who don't like to upgrade. I, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. And then a, a very underused uh, function out of Sprig that I see is dig. Dig's really cool because if you've got your Helm chart, it has, or excuse me, your values, and you want to deprecate some value and move it somewhere else. Really Say uh, I had under, uh, you know, well, Red Panda, listeners, HTTP, internal, TLS enabled. That was a long way down, and you had to do that for every listener. And maybe you want that, maybe you don't, but one of the things we wanted to have was like, no, I just want to turn them all on. So we had a top level TLS enabled, but then it was like, okay, well, how do I know if it's enabled? So, well, what if the enabled isn't on the, the listener? Well, then it, if you evaluate it, it's always going to be it's here. It's always going to be false if it's not there. But it's not an actual. It's it's it's, it's just bizarre because if you wanted if you wanted to override something, you end up with this false when it's not really false. So with dig, you can go through and if it's and you can say, from this resource, I want to go this depth, this depth, this depth. And if it's not there, this is the default I want. So you can set something to true, even if it evaluated to false, even if the, the key wasn't there when it got to that level, which is super handy. Um, so, oh yeah, I actually have an example. So, oh no, this isn't that one. It is that one. Yeah, so this is one where uh, if, Oh this, oh, this is just about returning, returning uh, JSON. 
Yeah, so returning JSON. So um, <laughs> I think I remember this. So if you, uh, you've got the, I've got this, this helper, and it's going to check to see if TLS is set. But TLS is commented out. So, or excuse me, enable is commented out. So normally it would error if you try to get values.tls.enabled because enable doesn't exist. He's, he's not, he doesn't exist. Um, but with this dig, it's going to check under TLS. Can I point to it? There it is. Dig's going to check under, under TLS, under enabled, and if any of that fails, the, just the result is false. So even though that key isn't there, it's going to return false. And because I've got the two JSON, I put it into a dict with the key bool. Then in my template, I can actually pull it back out, and I actually get a bool. It's not an empty string. It's not a, it would, it, you know, you could get an empty string. This is actually, I don't want an empty string. I just want to know if it's true or false. This is the way to do that. Got any other cool tips? You gotta get, I got it rolling. Okay. <laughs> uh, version comparison. Again, like, this is how you can compare your application version. I've got a, I've got a, I've got a uh, named template that is called apt at semver. I can compare the versions and do something based on the results. Um, or, my, or if my app doesn't, check, doesn't support that deprecated version, I just call a fail and avoid melting your CPU. By the way, the fail function, go back and check this out if, if any of you aren't using it. It's so handy in so many ways. We can do a whole session on that, so <laughs> talk to us after. Another spring, another spring function, yeah. by the way. All right, All right, Scott. Okay, awesome. Um, how much time do we have? Okay, cool, because I can like, talk for like five days in a row about this kind of stuff and just, I'll try to keep on track, but um, easy to fill up time. So, oh, thank you. All right, yeah, so, okay, so, how many of you actually have like, use, use Helm testing to test your charts? And you can be totally honest about this. Usually it's not that many people. But it's cool that some We're of you... We're talking the in-provided the in Helm testing, not any others. Yeah, yeah, it's cool that some of you do, and it's so handy. Um, basically, I mean, whether you're, whether you're making your charts available to the public or not, it's, it's really, really handy. It's so handy that when we had maintained the... I don't know how many of you used the stable and incubator repos when you first started using Helm, like Helm install stable WordPress or things like that. Um, that hasn't been around for a few years now. We've moved to distributed repos. But if you did, you'll know that um, they were all very well tested. That's one of the reasons that people use them. Um, there are still important Helm repositories out there. And not just, I don't mean just necessarily repos in the H, as in HTTP repos. Like, for example, Bil Bitnami is one very good example of a Helm repository even though their, their charts are in OCI too, but the, the actual source repository uses Helm testing before every, before every commit, and they also regularly run Helm testing. How many of you have either used Bitnami charts or have seen them, you reference them? If you haven't, please just look at them. You don't have to use them. They are a great resource on how to develop against Helm. Yeah, yeah, a, a lot of the Bitnami folks initially were also co-maintainers of, of that repo I was talking about, this, the, the former centralized Helm Charts rep repository with the hundreds of apps and stuff like that. It's still archived, so you can check it out if you want to, even though they're way out of date now. But the point is, they were, they were on that, and they c continue to follow a lot of those processes that they themselves set up, and many of us also set up and collaborated to develop, to help consolidate and build best practices for Helm's Charts. Um, again, some of them you might have better help, best practices. So really want to hear from all of you who are doing this in the wild now, because things continue to improve. But any, anyhow, um, so testing. The, uh, really the easiest way to start is you'll see a template if you do Helm create foo. Your foo chart is going to have a test, a test uh, uh, directory. Directory, directory, yeah, in the templates folder, and it's going to have an, ex an example template, um, and it's going to use, I think it uses the helm.sh slash the test hook. It, it does. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, I haven't looked at it for a while, but yeah, um, it should, so I'm glad it does. So you can look at that, and it's really basically follow a similar model. The idea there is that, that 
you can put any templates you want in there. They won't run any other time unless you're running Helm test. So it's very handy because if you, if for your, pers your chart uh, that you're writing, you need, I don't know, some, you need some custom CRDs, you need some, um, you need some stateful sets, you need lots of different things that you would be doing in other ways for your actual chart for production or for any other environments, you can mock those inside of this test directory. You got two minutes. Cool, so, uh, so yeah, check that out, uh, thank you. Um, also, check out the, the uh, github.com slash helm slash chart dash testing project. Um, a number of the former uh, charts maintainers are still a team on the Helm team and help to maintain that project as well as other tooling. You could just use that, you could just actually use that and not do anything special in your charts and you will have testing. Um, so basically, uh, in, in a similar vein, that same team of people, a subset of the other Helm maintainers, a subset of the total Helm maintainers, also maintain the chart releaser project. That is just a simple way to allow you to have a Helm repo without having to do anything, any kind of special steps yourself. Uh, there's a GitHub action set up for it if you use GitHub. If you use GitLab, you can still use the chart releaser project. You don't need um, a, a, a GitHub, or excuse me, a GitLab uh, CI. But if you do develop one, let us know because we'll, uh, I don't know. We'd, Contributions we'd, welcome. Yeah, we'd love to have that because right now we only have a GitHub action that wraps that. But the project itself you can call directly and through any other CI any way you want. So um, please, please check that out. Uh, there is also a nice little setup. It's not actually built in, but there's a nice uh, way to additionally push your charts to OCI uh, registries. Speaking of the devil. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, next one. Okay, so let's, let, yeah, uh, you should, well, you should consider this. Um, the reasons for it, uh, since I know we don't have a whole lot of time, um, I'm not gonna just read off of this, but um, OCI has a lot of benefits as opposed to using HTTP repositories. Um, one being that if you have a ton of Helm charts, there's no, in, there's no concept of in, an index file in an OCI registry. You don't have to worry about that. It will never be a continually growing thing. How many of you have heard of the concept of OCI artifacts? That was like drilled into everyone's brain throughout the keynote and a couple other sessions today. Guess what? Helm has been doing this for many years. So we've kind of trailblazed a lot of the work and a lot of the maintainers are currently working in open source projects like myself. I'm a maintainer on the Auras project. I joined Helm to become one to help push OCI artifacts across the finish line a couple of years ago. Um, I see OCI artifacts doing a lot of things and Helm is gonna take advantage of this entire ecosystem that is just starting to, you know, starting, just starting to incubate. And like one, one way we're using OCI artifacts is around signatures. You can now go ahead and sign you know, you sign your Helm charts very easily using tools like SigStore and other tools out there to make it even easier to provide pro provenance data to your, to your charts. Exactly. Pretty much anything that, um, well, most of the tools that are there to make working with containers nice and secure also apply to the, uh, the artifact type, the OCI type. So, you know, um, take advantage of it, you know. Uh, we, you know, you're all at KubeCon, so containerized workloads is not a new concept. It's been going on for a long time now. It's going on, it's been going on for less time for config as code. That's essentially what OCI artifacts are. Anything you want to store in there, you can store a database in there, but, but don't. You, you, you want to generally use config, and so you can deploy that along with your containers. That's the basic idea. Um, and, uh, okay, I mean, I guess now we just sort of tell you, stop by the booth, right? Uh, please stop by the booth and, and say hi to us. Um, uh, we've been, we've had like really awesome people maintaining the booth so far. I have not done it, but I will tomorrow and, um, say hi to me and then say hi to us on Friday. Yeah. If you're really interested in, we're going to make this a little interesting here. If you're interested in, in contributing to Helm, want to influence the project, but most importantly, if you're interested in this thing called Helm 4, yes, it's coming, come on Friday. We're going to talk about it. I know it's unfortunately the last session of the day at the conference. So if you're able to stick around and join, please come down to us. We're going to be in room E08 on this level. And aside from that, thank you very much for your attention today and enjoy Helm.